For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Business enterprise architect and strategist Kevin Governor is in conversation with Polity about his book titled The Rise of the Sharing Economy. Mr. Governor, the sharing economy was hailed as one of the 10 ideas that will change the world. Can you explain to our viewers the sharing economy model? So if you look at the sharing economy, what we're finding is that it's no longer about ownership. People are saying that we don't have to own something to experience something. So you're finding there's a big preference to having access to, for example, if you look at movies. Previously, people used to own all their movies and buy them. Now with the, the emergence of all the digital platforms such as Netflix, you know, Amazon Prime, people are saying, no, I, I will go and uh, I'll get access to this. Or if I look at the music part, it's Apple Music, it's uh, Spotify. So people are having access and where you pay a subscription fee. And in some cases, you even get it for free. And then when you want, uh, you know, advanced services uh, or additional type of services, uh, you pay for that. So that's the new way of doing it. You get even people that are owning cars are saying, you know what, I don't need to have two cars. We can have one car at home and we can Uber. Uh, and there's so many different types of uh, sharing services in, in South Africa that people are starting to take advantage of this. And some of the benefits is that you save cost. There's no burdens of ownership uh, associated with uh, excess, but there is burdens of ownership associated with ownership. And our country is faced with the issue of uh, unemployment rates rising to a record high of 34.9% in the third quarter of uh, 2021. Do you think that this model uh, extends to labor? And do you think that it is a key model that can help South Africa to revive its economy? Yes, I definitely think so. And the reason I say that, I mean, with the high unemployment, we talk about entrepreneurship. What my book also talks about is micro-entrepreneurship. And the definition of micro-entrepreneurship talks about you already owning an asset uh, that you own, but that asset is underutilized. And because that asset is underutilized, what it does is it gives you an opportunity to be able to take that asset, put it onto the platform and generate their income. And I'll give you some examples. 46% of people in South Africa that take part in or engage in uh, Airbnb, uh, accommodation sharing, they cannot afford their current uh, housing. And what they do is generate additional revenue through being part of the Airbnb so they can actually keep their house. So the same principle applies to other people who have a house, but... Uh, are finding it uh, hard to ma make ends meet, can actually engage in these things and be able to generate income. The same thing with car sharing or ride sharing. If you have a car and you're having challenges, you could actually, you know, there's lots of car sharing uh, apps on the in South Africa, for example, Uber, Bolt, uh, Didi. There's lots of these things. So what you could do, you could actually register on those platforms and uh, use your underutilized asset to transport people uh, and that generate uh, assets. The other thing you can do is if you have lots of underutilized assets or parts or equipment, you could actually go on to uh, other sites uh, or platforms and register that and get it shared where people can actually pay you for using the underutilized assets. So I think there's many, many options uh, available out there for people to engage on this on this platform. Uh, one good example, if you look at Aisha Pando, she created Sweep South. Sweep South is about domestic workers. And this platform, actually what it does, it matches people who can come and assist you clean your house with people that don't have help. These people that are registered on the platform, first they get, uh, get a, a good percentage of the, of the revenue that's generated because you are doing the work. But it's also an element of protection. Uh, in terms of it, and, and where, when I talk about protection is there's a two-way rating on the app. So I can rate the person who came and did the work for me and that person can rate me. And if they did, felt that, you know, I was unfair, didn't treat them well, uh, they could actually give me a low rating and then I would never come up as an option again for them to work for me and vice versa. So these are good ways of regulating that, but also providing jobs to a lot of people that don't have work. 
And in chapter seven, uh, which deals with now regulation and legislation, you say that a sharing economy and its key stakeholders are subjected to regulatory uncertainty and that regulators are unable to cope with the pace with which the sharing economy and its business models are emerging. Can you mention a few of these challenges? I look at chapter seven in the book and mm. some of the challenges, as you mentioned, there are mm. quite a few of them, right? Because the reality is that um, the world is changing. The governance that we regulate these companies are very different to your conventional uh, ways that is done. So if I look at some of these challenges that are faced, uh, one is equal pay, right? So for example, some of the Uber drivers claim that they don't get well compensated for what they earn. That's a major issue, right? If you look at uh, what we talk about safety, safety is a big uh, concern. Hygiene standards are big concerns. Taxes, how do you tax these people? How do you generate revenue out of that? I think are also very, very important kind of criteria that needs to be looked at. Local restrictions, what are the local restrictions? For example, some countries don't allow Airbnb or Uber to operate. Uh, some companies um, uh, talk about uh, limited allowances and other benefits. We talk about trust and safety. You know, some people have problems with these kind of things. So part of the process is how do we, how do we actually look at these kind of uh, policies? How do we adopt the policies to be able to cater for these new inventive companies? But at the same time, how do you regulate? For example, if you look at Airbnb, Airbnb talks about there's certain conditions hotels and lodges are, sub, uh, are accustomed to that they need to get involved in. But if you look at what's happening is, they are doing that. But if you look at other organizations, other organizations are actually saying, you know what, you're allowing these companies to uh, have no conditions. They can do whatever they want, but you, but you regulate me and it's not fair. So those are some of the challenges that I think are being formed from regulators. But also, you know, if you look at what's taxed, how it's taxed, when it's taxed, those are important criteria, right? And some people are saying, I need to pay tax, but those people are not allowed to pay tax. So part of this is saying, how do we change to be able to accommodate this? You mentioned in the book that uh, one may prefer to use a Bolt or Uber, like you've said before, like uh, instead of uh, owning a car or someone may may use his second car for that for, for as a service to other people. Why do you believe that uh, this is a key motivational factor during uh, driving the economy to this sector? The traditional way of doing it was owning a car. Mm -hmm. The shift is ride sharing using Bolt or Uber, right? The other thing is the traditional way was staying at a hotel and uh, the non-traditional way is about staying in a home through Airbnb. The same thing is previously where you used to get a loan from a bank. Uh, we're saying now you can get a loan from peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending platforms such as Rainfund and Lendico. And the same logic applies to buying CDs and DVDs and movies and those kind of things. Before you used to be able to buy your own DVDs or CDs to watch movies or listen to music, the new way of doing things is streaming uh, through Spotify, Apple, you know, Netflix, all these different things. So there's a fundamental change in the behavior. Now, what I did is I looked at the decomposed theory of planned behavior and I used that to model what are the key perceptions that are driving the change. And I'm, I was able to build a model that actually looked at four dimensions and 23 perceptions. The four uh, dimensions is monetary perceptions where it, it focuses on things like cost of the service, predictability of the cost, and absence of the cost. Then the second dimension was functional perceptions, things like, you know, what is the transactional effort? What is the post and pre and post usage effort? What is the maintenance effort, the storage effort? What are the limitations of the use, the inflexibilities and the risk of non-availability? Those were some of the functional. And then if you look at what we call the experiential uh, perceptions, things like trust, convenience, safety, perceived risk, need for careful handling, or environmental friendliness. And the last one being symbolic, being part of a community, uh, signaling one's personality, uh, personal attachment. Those are some of the um, perceptions that are driving consumers to either use the product or not use the product. I developed a model that kind of, uh, and I got the Golden Key Award for, for the different types of sharing, what are the perceptions that are critical for consumers and what is driving their attitude? 
For example, if you look at car sharing, safety, trust, convenience, perceived risk, risk of failure, risk of non-availability uh, are key things. So if you are designing a service, you've got to make sure that these things are features that are created in your design so that people will actually want to use these services because that is what attracts them to it. And while I was reading, Mr. Governor, I got to observe that sharing economy sectors, they require business people who are open to move with the times. Is that an accurate assumption? Yes, I think that's very, very important because what we're finding is, remember, even before COVID, a lot of organizations had a lot of challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them, for example, some companies go out of business. Uh, some companies cannot be, are not profitable anymore. They have, there's too many new competitors. So if you're, not, if you're not reinventing and reimagining yourself in the business, mm -hmm. there's a high probability that you will not exist. So it is very, very important that we need to adopt the new ways of working. We need to be able to look at different, uh, what we call operating models or business models that you need to adopt. Because, you know, if you look at a business model, a business model is about, it is the logic and principles that an organization uses to attract customers, generate revenue and gain competitive advantage. And, and what it does is, you know, an organization creates, delivers and captures value. But if you are not able to reinvent and reimagine your organization and take advantage of new business models such as the sharing economy, that could be to the detriment. So you need to be open-minded. You need to be able to look at how you can adopt and, and reinvent and reimagine your business to take advantage of some of the benefits that the sharing economy brings. Has COVID-19 pandemic impacted the sharing economy? And if so, how will sectors fully recover? I think that's a very good question, right? Because firstly, uh, you know, we all think that only traditional organizations was disrupted by COVID. But the reality is that actually COVID disrupted a lot of organizations, including the, uh, the shared economy. So the first thing, if you look at it, you know, any company that had physical requirements or presence was required, was affected. For example, mining, agriculture, the hospitality industries, because nobody could travel. So if you look at what has happened is uh, both, I would say both traditional organizations and the sharing economy was impacted. Now, to give you some examples of what was impacted positively and what was impacted negatively. If you look at uh, Uber car sharing, ride sharing, they were impacted. And the reason they were impacted is because you were not allowed to leave your house. So there was no need for people to move because you were in quarantine or lockdown. So Uber was, was highly, highly you know, impacted. Then if you look at Airbnb, the hotel and leisure sector, they were also majorly impacted uh, uh, because you couldn't go on holidays, you couldn't travel, you couldn't use flights. So major, major impacts on those organizations. But if you look at some of the organizations that actually benefited from uh, COVID, it is definitely your firstly, uh, your streaming service. People had to find new hobbies. So things like uh, music sharing, TV sharing, video sharing, all those things rocketed. For example, Spotify and Apple Music, there was an increased number of customers or uh, people that engaged in that. If you look at TV, lots of people were watching much more TV, subscribing to Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, DSTV, particularly DSTV in box office, uh, Showmax, all those kind of things. Then the other thing that was also positively impacted was bike sharing because although people were not allowed to mix, people saw an opportunity to, to do bike sharing or ride a bike because it was still, you know, you could actually isolate from other people. So those are some of the things where there was, you know, both the combination of positive and negative uh, impact on the sharing economy. And when I read uh, chapter 18, on the evolution of the sharing economy. You share interesting sectors uh, that you believe have the power to disrupt. Uh, it includes the future of agriculture and farming, as well as the future of parking and the future of errands. What do you see in these sectors? Firstly, let's talk about agriculture in South Africa. We all know that there's a huge amount of farmland available in South Africa, but a lot of people that own these lands do not have the capital or the equipment to farm these lands. 
So if you look at what uh, a company, for example, Hello Tractor. Hello Tractor is like they, they, they refer to as the Uber for tractors. So what they do is they provide tractor equipment to farmers who cannot afford to have their own tractors. The other thing that we, uh, there's also some statistics that say that when it comes to agriculture, uh, to be able to farm like 10,000 square meter or one hectare, if you do it manually, it probably takes you around 20 days to do. But if you had a tractor, you could do that in one day. And the cost of farming is much reduced if you had a tractor because of the economies of scale. There's a company in South Africa similar to uh, Hello Tractor, ALX, that does that. Because remember, the other thing you must, you must think about it, farming is, not the, is seasonal. So even if you have a tractor, the rest of the time your tractor is, is, is idle. So there's two opportunities. Opportunities for the people that don't have tractors to be able to have access to this and improve their productivity. And those people who have tractors, an opportunity to generate additional revenue from doing it. That's one area. The other opportunities in South Africa is solar sharing. There's a lot of people, you know, with, uh, with the challenges we have with ESCOM and load shedding, there's an opportunity for solar sharing. Uh, what about so with the challenges we're having? We already started seeing the impacts on water restrictions or water shortages or water uh, maintenance issues in the country, uh, ball sharing. The other thing that's quite important is like, if you look at fleet uh, facility sharing. Now, a lot of organizations have been disrupted by COVID in the sense that a lot of people are working from home. So what you're finding is a lot of people that, for example, built new buildings or leased new buildings no longer need the full capacity. A lot of buildings are under, underutilized. So there's an opportunity here for the sharing or the facility sharing. What about companies that are manufacturing companies that have large amount of equipment and machinery, but sometimes you only use those on a seasonal basis. The other time it's vacant. Opportunity for you to actually share that with other organizations and generate additional revenue from that. And then another example I'd like to talk about is uh, from a health sector. You know, we always know in South Africa and Africa, there's a challenge with the availability of medical practitioners, specialists, doctors, and also equipment. There's companies out there that have created what we call a medical sharing capability that allows doctors to work beyond borders and be able to provide services beyond the borders uh, virtually. The other thing that's going to happen in the future of the sharing economy is that the way the insurance companies insure products and people is going to fundamentally change because of the impact of sharing. And lastly, uh, Mr. Governor, what are you ultimately hoping readers uh, take away after reading your book, especially in a country with a history such as ours, where success is linked to ownership? Are you hoping that maybe more people will see the benefits of access over ownership? Yes, definitely. I think my, my research has definitely shown, uh, you know, I've done statistics across the various products to see how from, you know, in five years ago or 2014 till now, how it's evolved. So definitely there's, a, there's an increase and a rise in the number of people engaging and participating in access. But I think what's important to note is that, you know, in a country where a lot of people live be below the poverty line, affordability is an issue. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, with the emerging middle class that has come out, if you never owned before, you want to own because that is a a sense of achievement, a sense of, you know, owning something that you never was able. So you, when I did my research, some people also said, if I never owned before, I want to own because that shows I've arrived, I've, I've made it, I'm now. But also people are realizing the burdens of ownership and realizing, but you know, if I've done this before, it's no longer about the ownership, it's about the experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm comfortable having excess. My view is very simple. Ownership and access will always coexist. But the degree to which individuals will decide how much they want to own and how much they want to share or access will be different for different people. But there's definitely, if I look at now, everybody in some way or another is embarking on the sharing economy or sharing activities. I think the other thing is important to note, one of the things I wanted people to take out of my book, you know, we always look at global companies they are doing this, but we don't realize that there are vast amount of sharing companies that were 
born in Africa, grew out of Africa that is available to us, including global. So there's local and global sharing companies. And I think my book gives you a large number of lists across 15 different categories, industry categories where you can embark on sharing. And I've provided names of companies where you can embark on it. And I think that is what we need to look at. There is value in it. There's the power in sharing. There's also lots of advantages in terms of it. And, 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 I'm, and I'm, I would like to encourage people to firstly, you know, understand what is the sharing economy first, because I think it's still new to a lot of people. Get to understand what is available out there. What are the benefits and advantages of participating in the sharing economy and start engaging in it and enjoying it and experiencing it. There was Kevin Govinda in conversation with Polity about his book titled The Rise of the Sharing Economy.